Welcome to season 10. When you're good at what you do and you actually love what you do, then it can be challenging to figure out where or how to streamline your operations. Sometimes you just get stuck and need an outside opinion of someone who isn't as close to the situation as you are. Hi, I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre, and you're about to get a front seat to a live consultation with a mother and son team. They're looking to improve their kidding process for handmade gifts. They're gaining more exposure by the day and demand is steadily increasing. How can they keep it all together without compromising quality or worse, forgetting to include something in their customer DIY kits? We'll explore that and more. This is season 10, episode 121. Let's start the show. This episode is brought to you by RVIDI, an app that allows you to communicate privately in short video sound bites. Joining me for today's live workflow work session is Melanie and Sebastian Flores, also here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I'm so glad to see both of you. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Doing well, Sebastian? Oh yeah, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Now, Melanie, you and I, I, I call you one of my LinkedIn friends, because even though we haven't met in person, I, I feel, I already feel connected to you because we've been supporting each other through our posts and commenting and engaging with each other that way on LinkedIn. And I was immediately struck by the work, the, the business that you and Sebastian have started, which is Octo Gifts. So before we get started talking about, you know, the process that we're going to look at re recreating or possibly improving, why don't you all first tell us a little bit more about yourselves and this amazing company that you have, Octo Gifts. So Sebastian, let's start with you. Uh, I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm 14 and I'm a ninth grader at Denmark High School in Alpharetta. Um, uh, you want to tell her about um, how you got started or? Uh, oh, okay. So uh, I'm <laughs> Melanie Flores. <laughs> I'm his mom and I, um, I'm trained as an engineer and I actually worked as one for uh, 10 years. And then after having kids, I went to education for another 10 years. And what I'm doing right now with Sebastian, uh, I feel really blessed because I'm able to actually draw in elements of both of those parts of my life, as well as a love for STEM. So I feel like super excited to be building this with Sebastian um, right now and, and, and grateful for the chance to, to share our story. Absolutely. Well, well, don't keep us in suspense. Tell everybody who's listening and or watching, what exactly is your company? I know it's called OctoGifts, but what exactly is OctoGifts? Um, we're uh, kind of in between, like a little niche um, between cards and keepsakes. So our Octo gifts are made of paper and they're little candy dispensers um, that also double kind of as like a gift that you can give someone, that hence Octo gifts. Um, we got started, well really officially in January 2019. But okay. I think really it started all the way back in uh, 2016, or maybe 20, between like 2016 and 2017, because um, when I was 11, so that would have been around that time, uh, uh, I had a friend from school. And every time he would come over to our house, like, so he loves candy. So every time he came over to our house, he would uh, find some excuse to go into the kitchen and reach into the candy jar. <laughs> <laughs> thirsty for some reason. Wait, oh wait, I have to ask really quickly, what kind of candy did you keep? Was Were they like M&Ms or Skittles or? It was just like Mike and Ike's and little hard candies and oh, things wow. to keep okay. in a jar. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh. No, no, you're fine. Uh, so when his birthday came around, I wanted to make a candy dispenser that he could have had his own house, but I couldn't find anything like either on the internet or on YouTube or any books or anything that I had. Uh, so I decided to just make one myself. So I used an old candy box and a paper towel tube and uh, a sheet protector and a water bottle. Oh, and wow. I spent a couple hours um, just sitting on the kitchen floor with my craft knife and my hot glue gun um, putting <laughs> together this little candy machine. And when I gave it to him on his birthday, um, I remember he had this, like, this look of joy and awe on his face. So that's kind of, that was really the first Octo gift. And then later in January of 2019, I revisited that candy dispenser idea. 
and made it this time in a more professional heart shape, um, completely out of paper. I actually have one. Oh yes, we'd love to right see here. it. That is why, so cool. Why is cool. there candy in it? As you can see, it actually does dispense candy. Yeah. So <laughs> you can see, um, turn this. And the entire thing is made of paper with, with the exception of the, the plastic, right? That's, that's mm -hmm. for that yeah. particular one. Okay. Um, so I posted that on an Etsy shop I had started about six months before. Wow. And the first, I put up like uh, five or six on there at first. And they all sold out within 12 hours. Oh my gosh. So I made That's another one. That's awesome. Another batch. And the next two weeks or so were spent just making these and selling them on Etsy. Oh my gosh. Now, yeah. were, were, did you have different types? What, was it only that heart-shaped? Octopus. In the beginning, it was just the heart shape, okay. but now we have lots of different ones. Like, we have an entire product have, line. This one is like um, the flagship model, just the all-in-one candy dispenser. And then there's different um, add-ons that build on that. So here's one for graduation. See, it's got a little graduation hat. Yeah. And then here's one for Father's Day. So it's like a little uh, shirt and tie. And then there's... Some other little like hats that go on top, like a uh, baseball cap and a top hat. Now, and these, they aren't shipped. Are they shipped pre-assembled or some, is it more of a DIY where people, the recipients of these Octo gifts can actually assemble them themselves? How does uh, that Originally, work? we were selling them pre-assembled, but that took too long. Um, so we transitioned to making them as DIY kits. So they come in a little envelope. Um, like this. Well, not that small. Not There's this like small, but actual size bigger. I don't underneath know. the tray. They come in an envelope like this. Okay. Um, with all the pieces inside and then a QR code that you scan to get the instructions put together. Oh, well, that's, look at you incorporating <laughs> technology. I love it. A balance between the digital and analog world. That is so inventive. Is that, I'm just curious. This is me just, because I love arts and crafts too. The paper that you're using, is it, is it, thick like cardstock or um, yes it's cardstock okay, so it's cardstock oh that is so awesome now I, I, I'm kind of you explained the origin of the word octo gift but I, I must admit it kind of just went over my head Sebastian so <laughs> would you mind explaining how you came to call your company octo gifts um well that was the name of the Etsy shop that I posted the first heart on and it was called that because I started that to sell prints of artwork so I figured prints like ink um so octopus and then I liked the idea of gifts so octo gifts oh. but more than that it was just that the name the website name was available <laughs> <laughs> all the handles were available so we just grabbed it and we I liked it so it. we need to just grab it now before someone else makes it but you know what it's inventive it's memorable and to your point, um, and thank you for being so candid about that, it was available as a, as a URL. <laughs> um, and that, that, that makes all the difference in the world, right, these days. So, so that is great. Um, before we, well, actually, before I, before I even get into talking about the process that we're here to, to talk about today during this session, Melanie, I know during a previous conversation, you mentioned that you all have have recently been approached in some new and inventive ways about leveraging Octo Gifts as a team building exercise? Oh yeah, so, um, well I would say, first of all, we're all about building human connection uh, through things that, you can, that are fun to make and, yes. and fun to give and fun to keep. And we, our focus is, has been on families and kids and parents, and that, that's the bulk of our, our business is actually B to C. But recently, we've had people approach us because of the pandemic. People are starting to feel disassociated from each other, kind of remote and isolated. And so the suggestion was made, why don't you make those team building kits? Because they're easy. Obviously, a child can make them. So this is something maybe adults can do um, together, whether on a Zoom call or in person. So um, we actually did create a team building package, and it's on our website. But we, we, uh, we landed our first um, team building order just recently and Yay. yeah we're, we're excited awesome. yeah we're so grateful that, um, the person who, who ordered it said it was a success and he said that everybody 
uh, participated either by watching and just uh, and providing support or, uh, or building it themselves, but there definitely is an intergenerational appeal with these. So that's a new direction um, that we hadn't an originally anticipated, but that we can see growing in as well. Yes, and, and I, I already see the opportunities for, for growth in that respect. And so speaking of growth, as, as demand starts to continue to increase, Sebastian, for Octo Gifts, Obviously, that means you'll have to have those back office operations in place, and your mom already shared with me the pain that you went through in documenting standard operating procedures and how much, <laughs> how exciting that was for you. <laughs> I, I had to pay. <laughs> I had to offer it. Like, was any like, bribery involved, Melanie? <laughs> I wonder, do you think that was considered bribery? Compensation. <laughs> And it's kind of hard to get a teenage a teenage boy to get excited about writing an SOP. But I tell you, I promise you, Sebastian, it will be so worth it because again, as you as you continue growing and you have to start hiring people to help you, you don't want to you want to make sure that quality isn't compromised. You want to make sure that whether you package something, your mom packages something, your brother or someone else that you may hire, that they're going to produce that is going to be produced at the same quality consistently as if you were to do it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So I know it's painful, but I, I promise you it is, it is so worth it. So speaking of processes, Melanie, we use the RVIDI app to communicate about a process that you wanted to examine here on the podcast. So let's go ahead and take a, a listen to that video. Hi, I'm Melanie Flores and my 14 year old son Sebastian and I co-founded OctoGifts.com. We built joy and human connection through 3D greeting cards and keepsakes that are fun to make, fun to build, and fun to keep. They actually double as candy dispensers, so here's an example of one of our products. This is um, full of beads right now, but it actually can accommodate smooth round candies and this particular machine happens to have a baseball cap shaped lid. The process I would love to discuss with Alicia is the process by which we make these DIY kits. Um, we start out with these clear plastic envelopes and then we have these inserts we slide in and these paper parts that go in there and then we have two-sided stickers like this that actually adhere to these tabs in a certain direction. I would love to discuss with Alicia how we can make that entire kitting process more efficient. Hi, Melanie. I can't wait to talk to you and Sebastian on the podcast about how we can look at making your kidding process more efficient for Opto Gifts. The three questions that I have for you all that I want you to think about in preparation for our time together on the podcast. Number one, how are you actually storing inventory and sourcing the raw materials to compile a, a, a typical Opto Gift? The second question, are you using an inventory management system like Just-In-Time or JIT? And then third, have you and Sebastian ever considered outsourcing your kitting process to an inventory management company? We'll talk about those three things and more on the podcast. See you soon. Before we actually talk about the kitting process, so for those who are listening who may not be accustomed to dealing with physical or tangible goods, would either of you mind explaining what kidding means for those who don't have the benefit of knowing what that word means? Uh, kidding, kidding refers to our process of putting everything together into a packet or package that someone else can pick up and have everything they need right in it. So it's our kit. Mm -hmm. we literally, we, we literally sell um, do-it-yourself kits and the process of assembling them is what we consider kidding. Correct. Okay. And so it sounds like there are opportunities for more efficiency in the way that you all kid. And so I asked three questions. How are you storing inventory of your raw materials or the goods that you, that com com comprise your kit? And are you all using a method called just in time inventory? And we'll get into all of that, but I was wondering, I'm going to grab my tablet here so that I can start sketching out your process as we talk. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly for those who are listening. Make sure you go and watch the video version of this so you'll have the benefit of seeing 
what I'm doing. Okay, so we have a blank. Yes, we're starting off with a blank canvas. So I was wondering, Sebastian and Melanie, would you all, can you walk me through your process from the moment you receive an order to actually shipping that order? So for many companies that deal in physical goods, we call this an order to ship or an order to delivery process. And I want us to think about it in terms of stages. So if we think about the first stage, I'm just going to draw one here, and we say receive order. Okay. What's yeah. the next thing that happens in your process? I will print. I will go into our store. Um, we're a Shopify site. I'll go in there, and I'll actually print the packing slip. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will print the uh, the packing slip for that order so that I know exactly what it is that needs to be assembled. And I'll put it inside a, a clear plastic sleeve so that rep represents an open, an open job. Okay. And then you have to actually fulfill that order, correct? Yes. So we have receive order. I'm just going to put it as packing slip. And then we have that you actually fulfill the order. And is that at that point what you're considered kidding? Or what does fulfilling the order actually look like for you? So that is whether they're ordering our DIY um, gumball machine or just uh, this baseball cap add-on, which is what I had in the RVD. It's the exact same thing. I, I then grab one of the clear plastic contain, clear plastic bags like this, and then I um, add all the components that go into it. And we have a, a process flow sheet that actually um, describes all the things that go into the shipping envelope after that. So first, so first I, um, after I, full, after I um, print out the packing slip, then we get these and either I or one of the kids will actually put in all the things that have to go into that. And we, we have uh, different visual cues that we use depending on what kit it is, whether it's for the DIY gumball machine or if it's for this smaller baseball cap add-on kit. And so everything, we look at that, that visual cue to know what goes in there. And once it's all in there, then we, then we seal the clear envelope and then we ship it and when we when we go to ship it that's where we refer to this process flow chart that that we have that also tells us what else is supposed to go inside the the bubble envelope or the mailer sure okay so if we have here five main stages so starting with ship the order we have packing slip i should put print packing slip, fulfill the order, which is part of that kitting process, packaging the order, and then shipping the order. One of the, so I, I refer to this, this is a foundation, Sebastian and Melanie, of what I call creating a service delivery blueprint, where you look at your overall process, again, from the moment you're placing the order to actually getting it out of the door and shipped directly to the customer, what are all of the things that take place and how can we group those activities into stages? So that's what we've done right here. We have five main stages. The next thing we would look at would be the different people that are involved in each stage, the different tools, the actual steps. So Melanie, just as you were already, you were, I could tell you, you already know this process pretty locked down in your, in your head. You know the steps for each stage and then the metrics. So we're going to get into each of these areas for each of these stages, or we'll talk through it rather at a high level. But I just wanted to give you an understanding or an idea of what it would look like in general. So if we, if we talk about the kitting process specifically, so let me use a different color here. Have you all actually written out a specific process as it relates just to kidding? <laughs> no, okay. we have not. No. So here's, here's what I would recommend. So we're going to first, this is what I recommend first. 
you're going to do this, this overall service delivery blueprint. You could do it either as a table in Microsoft Word or, you know, it might even be better if you do it in Microsoft Excel. And I, I can definitely send you a template for creating that. That's not a problem at all. But in this very first column, again, going across, you're going to have the different stages. And then the very, the, on the left-hand side, again, you're going to have an, a section for people, tools, steps, and metrics. And let me show you what this looks like, actually. Okay, can you see this? This yes. is, these are stages. This, this example comes from a chapter in my book where it's a real estate company. And these are the different stages of their overall process. So from the moment a person says, I need, I, I found a perfect home. Now I need to apply for a mortgage. This, this is the overall process that this mortgage company takes, goes through. Okay, so you can see they have, let's see, one, two, whoops, sorry about that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven stages. Mm -hmm. Let me just hide that there. But if we go here to the next one, this is what that service delivery blueprint is going to look like, Sebastian, once you all fill it out. So if you look across at that very first row, you see pro the prospecting stage, the pre-qualification stage, and the pricing stage. And then you notice on the far left, we have the, the people, which are also, you know, AKA the required resources. So who are all of the people that are needed specifically as it relates to prospecting? What are all of the tools that are needed specifically as it relates to prospecting? What are the steps at a very high level that take place in that particular prospecting stage? And then lastly, what are the metrics? Do you know what I mean when I say metrics, Sebastian? Um, no. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. So let's talk about that. So metrics basically means, and let me just pull up, I'm going to pull up your service delivery blueprint here for Octo Gifts. So for metrics, metrics in your case would literally mean how much time is it taking in each of these stages? So from the moment you receive an order, approximately how long does it take before you get to that next stage of actually printing the packing slip? These are the types of things that you can start measuring, Sebastian, so that you can figure out how you can get even better, how you'll be able to start to process more orders in a shorter period of time. Is it possible for you to leverage some type of automation? Is it some type of new technology? Is it some type of machinery? Does it mean more people? Whatever it, you can do to actually get that number, in your case, I would imagine people would want a relatively quick turnaround from the moment they place their order to the, the moment that they actually receive their order, right? Yeah. Um, so in this case, if we look at the fulfill order stage, which is the kidding process, we would figure out who are all of the people that are needed in order to fulfill an order. Okay, so just think about that. What are all of the tools that you need? So one of the questions that I had when I submitted my video response to you, Melanie, is how are you all storing the materials, the raw materials that are necessary that go into the, the actual kit? So currently everything, these kits are like 95% paper and we keep all of the paper stored by color in, uh, there's an area of our basement that's, um, that's basically our production area and it's all sorted there. Um, the, the, uh, the gumball machines, all of our kits, and they come in different colors, so we do have it sorted by color. Okay. But um, most of it is white, because um, the, the internals of every card, they're all white. It's just the, the, the color just comes on the outside for most of our product. Okay, so that's great. So you do have your, your basement slash production area, <laughs> which is yeah. great. Um, and so I'm assuming everything is labeled? Yes, so that everything is, is labeled. Okay, so that you can get to it fairly quickly. And again, if you had to bring in some of Sebastian's friends to help out, they would, they would know and understand how to access the information. The other thing is, 
whoops, my, my surface here went out a bit. The other thing is um, from a just-in-time inventory management perspective. Are you familiar with that by any chance? I have heard of it. I, I am familiar with it, but we don't use it for our, our business yet. Um, okay. Or I guess if we do, it's, it's, it's the raw organic kind, which is we get the order and we fill it just in time. So, so what it means uh, for both of you, it basically means that you order materials, your raw materials, in your case, the paper, literally as it's needed. So what happens oftentimes is what's called a, it, it promotes the use of what's called a Kanban. Have you heard of that? K-A-N-B-A-N? I've heard of that, but I'm not that familiar with it. Okay, so what that basically means, and it's a Japanese term, uh, this all comes from the Lean and Six Sigma methodologies. And I know mm -hmm. you all, well, Melanie, I know you know what that is. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain what that means also, Sebastian. So Lean and Lean Six Sigma are basically methodologies to help you in your production process. So Lean is all about figuring out where you can reduce waste wasteful time, wasteful motion, wasteful activities, for example. Six Sigma is about ensuring that you rid your process, your production process of defects and errors. So Six Sigma says every single Octo gift that leaves our production facility needs to have zero defects. One, the slightest defect is unacceptable. So that's what Six Sigma is about. But before you can get to applying either of those methodologies, you first have to have your processes documented. And that's what messes up a lot of people. So if we think back to your, again, your service delivery blueprint, and you had those different stages, those five main stages, if we focus again on just that kidding piece, I would want you to actually map out what that process looks like. And here's what's powerful about mapping a process and as opposed to, I'm trying to sign back in here. Give me a moment. I'm trying to sign back into my tablet. It went out on me. Give me just a second. Okay. Technology is great when it works, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, let's see. That should do it. Yes. Okay, so while, while I get that going up, when you wrote your standard operating procedures, were those written as literally in a step-by-step -step format? Step one, you do this. Step two, this is the next thing you do. How was it constructed? Well, actually, his brother wrote the SOP, and Sebastian and I looked it over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and his brother, his name's TJ, wrote it in text form. Can I just say, you, you're already an, a phenomenal CEO because you know how to delegate. That oh, is yeah. the he's, key. That is the key. All of, he's all about delegating sometimes. That is the key <laughs> to being an effective CEO, my friend. You have, you have figured it out already. Um, so let me share this. Well, actually, I think I'm out of the Zoom meeting, but let me just describe what I'm talking about. So let's say if step one is review the order, Step two is print the packing slip, and then we start to get into the actual kidding piece, where step three is um, pull all of the different types of paper that are necessary for that particular order and anything else that goes along with that order, including the envelope and, and the packing slip and whatever else would go inside of it. That's a true standard operating procedure because it's listed in steps. But if you wanted to go and analyze that process, Melanie and Sebastian, and figure out where potential bottlenecks are, in other words, where do you get hung up in that process, it's very difficult to understand that when you see it in that format. If you use a flow chart instead, that's going to allow you to visualize how the information and how your work is actually flowing. And I'm so sorry that I can't connect my, my tablet right now, but, but I will definitely connect offline so that I can, I can sketch that out for you. So 
a flow chart, are you, you're familiar with flow charts, right, Sebastian? Mm -hmm. Because you already have a flow chart, right? So what you would do in this case, if you wanted to flow chart your kitting process, you would have all of these boxes, lines connecting these boxes. You would have some decision points, which we usually represent as diamonds on that process flow chart. And depending on the answer to a question that's being asked, you can take different, different paths, right, within that process flow chart. What I want you all to, to consider doing is once you create a flow chart version of your kitting process, between each step, there's something that we calculate called the processing time. I'm sorry, the wait time. How much time lapses between that first step and the second step? That's what we would call the wait time. Then you would look at what's the wait time between steps two and three, between steps three and four, so forth and so on. For each step individually, we, have, we calculate what's called a processing time. So for step one, how long on average does it take to perform that very first step? And underneath that box on your flow chart, you would literally write, in Six Sigma, we would do it this way, PT equals X. So processing time equals 10 minutes. Processing time equals one hour. Processing time equals one day. Whatever that unit of measurement, that unit of time measurement actually is, you would just write that out onto your flow chart. And then once you've analyzed how much time it takes between each step, as well as how much time each individual step takes, you would then be in a position to calculate what's called the cycle time. So if you can imagine an equation, it would be CT equals PT plus WT. So cycle time equals processing time plus the wait time. Now, Sebastian and Melanie, you may look at what your overall cycle time is just for kidding. And you, it may be, I don't know, what's, what's, a, what's a, a best guess? Let's just say 20 minutes. Okay, 20 minutes. Well, you all may say, you know what? These orders are starting to come in fast and furious. We've got to get this down by another 50%. We need to get this down from 20 minutes to 10 minutes. How can we do that? Where can we go into this process? What's taking the longest time? So I, even though I'm, I'm unable to draw this right now, I'm hoping you can at least visualize why it's so much powerful to see a process in a flowchart format as opposed to being in a standard operating procedure. Because, oh, yes. yes, when you want to get to the point where you actually start improving and seriously streamlining a particular process or workflow, being able to have that visual diagram is just going to be so much more impactful than looking at it in a step-by-step -step format. Gotcha. Okay. Now, with just-in-time, so getting back to what Kanban is, Kanban says... Kanban, I believe, is Japanese for signal, I believe, or Q. So the, the whole concept of this and the way this was introduced into, into the Lean Six Sigma framework, and, and Lean, by the way, comes out of Toyota. Six Sigma comes from Motorola. Um, some executives years ago were, I think it was some Japanese executives from Toyota, the Toyota company. They were here in America, and they, they toured a grocery store. And they realized that on some of the shelves in the grocery store, let's say if it was some of some candy, Sebastian, that you're buying to fill your, your Octo gifts, um, let's say some jawbreakers or something like that, jawbreaker candies. And they would notice that sometimes you, they would see a tiny little colorful card in between two boxes of jawbreakers. And they said, well, I'm noticing these, these different colored cards, like index cards that were different colors. What the heck is this? Oh, this is like a Kanban. This is our way of, of knowing when it's time to start ordering more jawbreakers. So for you, and that's where just-in-time comes in, you don't just keep ordering inventory or materials in bulk because that can become expensive and you're just sitting on that inventory most of the time. Just-in-time says, let's, from an inventory management perspective, just order what you need when you need it. 
So for you, what you could possibly do is go back into your production facility in your basement and you could create some type of, I don't know, it might be even just be a post-it note, different colored post-it notes. And you may decide when this particular stash of red cardstock gets to where we only have 20 sheets left, that's our visual cue to know that we need to go and order more. And you probably have to allow for even more shipping time now for your raw materials because of what's going on with the pandemic, I would imagine. Have, have you all run into that as an issue lately? Is it taking longer for certain things to arrive? Some things, most things are still arriving quickly, but we have noticed um, some things taking longer than what I remember in the past. Mm -hmm. And that way it's, when you set up this Kanban, it's, you're almost on autopilot. You don't have to keep reminding yourself. You have these visual cues that serve as that reminder for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so another thing, let's, let me take a look at my notes here because there was quite a bit that I wanted to mention to you. So we talked about processing times, wait times, identifying where bottlenecks are. And again, a bottleneck is anywhere your process gets hung up. A lot of times in processes, it could be a person. You might be waiting on one particular person to do something, and that person might be the holdup in getting an order out even quicker than, than it might normally go out. Um, so you want to identify where those different bottlenecks are in your process and figure out, again, how can you either eliminate them or reduce them as much as possible. Is any of this making sense, Sebastian? <laughs> yeah. He's just looking like, ah. <laughs> now, we've talked about process, right, and, and which is definitely a key component of business infrastructure. But for those who are listening or watching for the first time and they don't know what business infrastructure is, let's, let's just kind of define that. So business infrastructure is a system for how you link your people, your processes, and your tools so that growth happens in a sustainable and profitable way. So again, we've, we've, we've talked again at a very high level about that process. So we started off talking about creating that service delivery blueprint and then looking at each stage individually capturing those processes, then figuring out how you can flow chart it so that you can streamline it even more. But let's talk about the people aspect. So Melanie, are you the assistant? Is that safe to, to, to say? Or uh, <laughs> is Sebastian the CEO? What, what's going on here? <laughs> it depends on what the topic is. I would, I would say I would say he's like the chief creative officer. He comes okay. up with all the ideas and he delegates to me all of the boring adult stuff. So pretty much <laughs> everything that relates to the taxes, the marketing, all of the paperwork, um, I do it and I, I, I expose him to it, but I'm the one who carries that. And he's the one who comes up with all the design ideas and the improvements to, to the product. And he definitely chimes in. I, I go to him when, when we're doing marketing. I go to him and say, what do you think of this? Um, and he can tell me if, it, if he thinks it will resonate with, with our target, you know, with kids anyway. Mm -hmm. So as you all continue growing in this, because I already know this is, this is it's already t starting to take off. Who do you think some of your first hires will be? Who do you think? Um, can anybody do it as good as you can, Sebastian? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, eventually we'll have to hire people uh, um, to operate, like to make the pieces for the kids. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's why having those processes are going to be so important because you want to make sure that they can produce at the same level that the quality would be at the same level as if you produced it yourself. So, yes. um, and have you all ever thought about, you know, when you get to that point where you've outgrown the basement, because that's definitely going to happen. Have you thought about potentially outsourcing your inventory management to a third party company? Oh yes. Yeah, that would, that's definitely something we would want to do. And, okay. and you're right that the first thing we would look at is actually first outsourcing production, getting more hands 
into the business to help us actually make these things. Right. Um, but, and then after that would be actually outsourcing the order fulfillment. And do you think, because it, because it is so manual, this is considered origami, right? Um, or is it a form of origami? Or um, I don't think so, because okay. this has a lot of cuts and multiple pieces. Okay. But it's inspired by origami. Inspired by origami. Yeah, okay. it is. Because yeah, okay. we're transforming flat paper into, into 3D shapes. So do you envision at, at some point incorporating machinery to, to automatically cut out some of these different pieces instead of oh, doing already, everything by hand? They, we already have machines that do that. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. next step is just going to industrial scale. Ones. Right, right, right. Okay, awesome, awesome. So, as, so we've talked about the process. We've talked about the people component. When it comes to the tools, um, so again, those Kanban cards, Go to Amazon and just do a search on Kanban cards, and you'll see some of the, the kind of cool products that people have come up with. And I'm, I'm almost positive I've seen something on Etsy, and I definitely remember doing a search one time, and even people posted up pictures on Pinterest of, of how they use their Kanban systems. So, oh, definitely yeah, it's, it's really cool, and people have found multiple ways of using it. But again, it's, it's anything that you can do to serve as a, a visual reminder, and so usually having bright colored post-it notes or even pieces of card or, or index cards, card stock um, usually helps in, in that sense. Um, we've already talked about your production area. I know that you have that already organized, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> My label maker was very busy. <laughs> but I wanted to mention something else. I know that you all don't need convincing about the, the value of operations and processes and procedures and having systems in place, but are you familiar with the E-Myth, this book, the E-Myth Revisited? I am not. Really? Yeah. Get on Amazon. So the E stands for Entrepreneur. It's by Michael Gerber. I always send people here whenever they don't think that operations are worth the time, effort, and energy. And the reason is because um, so the E stands for entrepreneur, and the myth, according to Michael Gerber, and I definitely agree with him, is that most people, when they, when they start their businesses, let's say if you're really good at making widgets, and you say, well, you know what, I either got laid off from my widget making company, or I just quit my, my job at, at widget making company ABC, I'm going to start my own company making widgets because I'm really good at it. And all you've done, in essence, is you've created another glorified job for yourself. So he's saying the myth is that most of us who start our businesses because we're good at, what, at a particular craft, in this case, literally crafts, we think that we can start a business. But most of us lack the vision that's needed by a true entrepreneur and the managerial perspective that's needed by people who are very good at making sure all of the systems are in place, the processes, the procedure, all of the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed. So he says there really takes, it really takes three different personality types to run a business, a successful small business. You have to have the entrepreneur, who's the visionary, the manager, like yourself, Melanie, who makes sure all of the processes and the procedures are getting taken care of, but you do still also need the technician. And those are the people who, those are the widget makers. Those are your developers, your coders, your programmers, your, your designers, the people who are actually doing the work. So I think it's, it would be really great if you could, could get that book. Um, I'm also going to plug my book, which is called Behind the Facade, How to Structure Company Operations for Sustainable Success. It literally spells out a framework for how you create things like that service delivery blueprint and your, your different processes and procedures. The last book that I want to tell you all about, it's called The Toyota Way. And I can promise you, Sebastian will not read this. It is not a, it is not a bedtime story, okay? <laughs> But if you are interested in learning more about lean, you're, you're going to love this book. So it's um, by Dr. Jeffrey Liker, and he spent over 20 years studying Toyota. He talks about Kanban among 
many other principles in this book. So if you want to learn more about it, and I, I personally find it very helpful to read about what other companies do and then try to figure out how you can apply those same principles and techniques to your company, even though you might be in completely different industries. You know, here we're talking about an automobile. For you, we're talking about Octo gifts, which is, you know, as Sebastian said, a cross between a, a gift card and, and a keepsake. So I just find it very helpful. And you can learn, again, even more about the Kanban system as well as just-in-time inventory management. Great. Yeah. That's a, those, are, those sound like some good books to check out. Any questions? Um. You have any questions, Sarasha? No, I think you covered everything. Yeah. Okay. What about flow charting? Are you comfortable with, well, it sounds like you already have some flow charts that you, you all are le leveraging. What tool are you using to create those? I'm actually using PowerPoint right now. Oh, There's that's probably that's a better tool, or is there? Well, I use Vizio. Vizio. I use Vizio, but um, I know some people, you know, unless they do, unless they do a substantial amount of flow charting, they, they don't... <laughs> They say Visio isn't worth the learning curve, but for me, I, I definitely prefer to use Visio. But Microsoft PowerPoint is great, also. I do actually have a question for you. Um, okay. Maybe the this would be the same thing as maybe this would be what we would upgrade into a flowchart. But right now, something that I use to to know that I'm putting everything that's supposed to be in the kit in the kit um, is actually a literal picture. And I set it out in front of me, and I just grab those things. Sebastian doesn't use it because he has it all in yes. his head. He, he makes fun of me that I actually have to use that, but I because there's not very many pieces. I would but I don't need it miss too. Anything. I would need yeah. it too. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is super unsophisticated. So I'm wondering if uh, what you're recommending the uh, what did you call it? The, the we would have to we would want to replace this picture. I'm assuming with the um, the service delivery blueprint. Oh, service delivery blueprint. No, you still need the pictures because here's the thing. Different people process information in different ways. So for some people, they need to see that step-by-step -step procedure. Some people would do better looking at it in a flow chart format. Some people would even do better looking at it as a video. If you could actually show, have these short, you could use something like RVD, for example, and create these short video clips demonstrating how to do these different parts of the overall assembly process mm -hmm. and then stitch them all together into one video. You could then post, uh, post all of those videos into a private YouTube channel if you wanted to, if you, you know, obviously you don't have to make it accessible to the, the general public, but that's another way of doing it. And it's a fast way. So again, it really depends on how people best process information. Okay. And, and also, it depends on what, is, what are you trying to accomplish with your process? If you're really trying to use that process to train other people, that picture is phenomenal because there's no, there's no you know, it contains everything. And so <laughs> if someone were to say, well, I didn't know and no one told me, here's the picture. The picture was <laughs> right there in front of you. If you are trying to seriously improve a process, you definitely want to have a flow chart. So it really depends on what is the objective that you're trying to accomplish with each process that you capture. Are you trying to train someone? Are you trying to get it documented so that you can eventually sell Octo gifts? If someone were to make you an offer, you would have to have everything documented, you know, to, to the most minute detail so that someone else could pick it up, buy it, and, and just hit the ground running. Or, again, if you want to make sure that you improve the process, you can, you can flow chart it out. So there's multiple ways. Um, there's also a different type of way, and I talk about this a lot in my book. Some people also have document their processes as they're filing for a patent application or some type of a copyright. So just know, Sebastian, too, that if you have intellectual property, if there's a special way that you do what you do or a special way that you are assembling your different Octo gifts, you might be able to file for some type of copyright or I think it's a design patent. 
-hmm. that, that you might be uh, eligible for. And again, process, I can tell you right now, process, they definitely want processes as a part of those applications. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the show. Oh, thank you for coming on and, and talking about your company. And so for those who want to learn more about how they can get their hands on an Octo gift or they just want to learn more about the company, what's, where's the best place for them to go? Um, our email, info at octogifts.com and our website, octogifts.com. Okay. And that is spelled O-C-T-O-G-I-F-T-S. Dot com, octogifts.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely going to be checking in on both of you to check on your progress because what I'm going to do at the very last episode of this season, I'm going to give a progress report on everybody who comes on this season so that we can track and monitor your progress. So I will be watching you, <laughs> Sebastian. I'm going to be making sure you get those processes in order, especially that kidding. Let's recap the steps for not only improving the kitting process for Octo Gifts, but for your process as well. I'll make sure I use generic terms so that you can apply these steps to your business as well. Now, keep in mind what I am about to describe. I'm, I'm doing my best because we are, this is a podcast, so I'm going to use as descriptive language as I possibly can. But in order for you to actually really understand what I'm talking about, it really is best if you go ahead to businessinfrastructure.tv. Make sure you look for episode 121 and you'll see the video version of this. So let's get into it. First things first, it always helps to take a holistic view of the overall service delivery process. In the case of Octo Gifts, this requires capturing all of their steps from order to delivery. Now for you, it might mean your lead to customer conversion, procurement to pay, or even your raw materials to finished product. We're gonna start with actually highlighting all of the steps in your process at a very high level. So for sake of simplicity, bear with me here, but I'm going to do things generically, but I hope you'll get the point. So let's start with those high level steps for your process. And let's say you actually write out those steps. Once you've identified all of those steps, and there, there could be a range from, let's say, seven to as many as 50. The point is, get high level enough, but not so detailed that you miss the point of this exercise. The next thing that you wanna do is take a different color marker and actually start to group these different steps that you've identified into stages. So let's say if we group this number, steps number one and two, Let's call that stage A. And we'll do three, four, and five as stage B. And then lastly, steps six and seven, we're gonna call stage C. Now, now that you have your steps, as well as your stages, we're now actually going to create that service delivery blueprint or matrix that I was describing to Melanie and Sebastian. So all it is is simply a matrix or a table with different columns and rows. So let's go ahead and get that set up. In our very first row, we're going to have the names of each of these stages. So in this case, we have A, B, and C. Now this is going to make up our very first row. See? Now we have our table. Again, this is the stages at the very, on the very first row. Now in our very first column, I want you to write in the second row, first column, I want you to write the words people. Underneath that, you're going to write tools. 
And then underneath tools, you're going to write steps. And then lastly, in our very last row, we have metrics. Now, here's where we're going to take this information from this very first sheet of paper and we're going to populate this table with that same data. So I'm just going to write this in green just for the sake of being able to show how I'm transferring this information over here. So for stage A, what Melanie and Sebastian, as well as you, if you're doing this for your own company, what they're going to have to figure out is within this particular stage, as we talk about steps number one and two, who are the actual people that are involved in performing these different steps? So let's say we have Sebastian. He's the CEO. And we have Melanie. And she's the COO. So hopefully you get the idea here. You're going to put the steps that are associated with that stage and identify the people who perform these different steps and then you're going to write out the actual tools. And what I mean by tools are specific processes, checklists, templates, equipment, software, furniture, anything that you are using in the process of executing these different steps. So again, for simplicity's sake, we'll just put some squiggly lines here just to show that you've populated that information. And we'll go on here to put steps four, five, and six for B. And then, whoops, sorry there, <laughs> three, four, and five, and then steps six and seven. And then you'll fill out the rest of the table as such. Now, the important thing that we want to point out here are the metrics, this very last column. The metrics that you assign to every single one of these B stages identifies how you're going to measure the performance. It's also going to give you an idea of how to identify where the bottleneck exists. So let's say, for example, Melanie and Sebastian have identified that their metrics all have to do with time. They're time-based. So it could be that this first metric for stage A is, let's say, five minutes. Stage B might be 20 minutes. And then lastly, stage C might be 10 minutes. This represents the average amount of time that it's taking them to perform each of these stages. Now, as you can see, we have 5 minutes, 20 minutes, and 10 minutes. In their case, they knew that they wanted to reduce the amount of time that it was taking in their kidding process. So if we were to call stage B, just hypothetically, kidding, this is the stage that they want to focus on. And their goal might be to get this from 20 minutes down to 10 minutes, which would, in, which, which would excuse me, significant, significantly decrease the overall amount of time that it takes to progress through all of these different stages. So now let's take a closer look at this stage, stage B, and we're going to go to this final sheet of paper here. We're going to take steps three, four, and five. Excuse me, I made a mistake here earlier. And we're going to start to draw a process map. And this is where you can start to get more detailed with the information that you provide and everything that's going on within this particular stage. Now this is a very, very basic, very rudimentary process flowchart, or what some would call a process map. But what we've done is we've said this is stage B, steps three, four, and five, and we're putting it in the format of a flowchart. The reason this is important is because it's going to help you single out where the opportunities to streamline this process may or may not exist. So let's take a different color marker here. There are two things that I want you to focus on when you get to this stage. 
That's processing time. And then what we, we have what we call the wait time. Really quickly, your processing time is the amount of time that it takes you to perform every single step. So on average, how much time does it take you to perform step B3, step B4, and step B5? The next time measurement that we're going to calculate is the wait time. So we call this wait time one and wait time two. The wait time is the um, average amount of time that, it, that passes before going from the end of step B3 to the beginning of step B4, from the end of step B4 to the beginning of step B5. Why does all of this matter? Because it's going to help you figure out where you can pinpoint exactly where an issue is causing the overall process to slow down. The next measurement that you're going to calculate is what's called your process's cycle time. And your cycle time is literally calculating every single process time that you've identified as well as the different wait times. That's going to give you your overall cycle time and from there, you can figure out, again, where is, where is, what's the holdup? Why is this causing our cycle time to be 20 minutes? Is there a way we can get it down to 10 minutes? And it could be that as you analyze what's really going on within each of these steps, that you then figure out maybe there are additional people that we can hire. Maybe there's additional technologies that we can invest in, equipment that we can upgrade to, so forth and so on. What is it that's going to allow you to get that processing time and maybe even the wait time down as much as possible? That's what's going to help a company like OptoGifts with Melanie and Sebastian figure out how they can reduce their kitting process without slowing down their overall order to delivery process. Don't you just love the imaginations of children and young adults? This session with Sebastian gives me hope that our collective future is in good hands. And kudos to Melanie for supporting her son with the resources to bring his ideas into fruition. I wonder what's in store for them. What do you think? My guess is that they'll soon outgrow their basement. How soon do you think they'll have to outsource their kitting as well as their inventory management processes altogether? The best way to find out is by making sure you subscribe to the podcast and to our YouTube channel at businessinfrastructure.tv. When you do so, you'll receive a notification when the last episode of this season premieres, and that's where I'll give an update on their progress. In fact, you can even request your own private one-on-one consultation with me. We'll also have links to all of the resources mentioned during this episode in the show notes. Again, all of this is available at businessinfrastructure.tv. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and for being a loyal subscriber. Remember, stay focused, be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Until the next time. For those of you who are listening and or watching, again, the best way to contact them is info at octogifts.com. And their website, one more time, is octogifts.com. Melanie, Sebastian, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And I really do wish all of the best for you because you have an amazing product, a very creative mind, and you will go very, very, very far. I'm sure of it. Thank you. You're Thanks, welcome. Alicia. Thank you.